Greetings, listeners and watchers of the ReSound channel here on the YouTube machine. And a very big thank you to you if you've already subscribed to this channel. This is the second episode of the Visions webcast, and this episode will be audio only. Let me explain. There are a few episodes in the works with the guest you are about to meet, and due to the sensitive nature of the topics being discussed and the personal history of my guest, who we'll call Jane, she has decided to not appear on video and to remain otherwise anonymous in favor of getting her story told without compromising her own safety or the privacy of her family. What you are going to hear is a story that we only think happens to characters on television crime dramas or Hollywood movies. These things have never happened or happened to people we know, or do they? Jane's story begins here with a pretty normal childhood, growing up in a small rural town in Ontario, Canada. But then due to circumstances far beyond her control, she found herself in her preteen years living in the core of one of Canada's most infamous urban ghettos. Being exposed to crime, drugs, gangs, and sexual violence were a daily occurrence, not just for those around her, but for Jane herself. Her story is one of perseverance, strength, and determination, bringing herself out of that spiral of addiction and violence and crime, and to become a beacon for others trapped in that cycle to see that there is indeed a way up and out. We will hear Jane's story across a few episodes as our conversations run pretty long, but it's a fascinating story. Here is episode one of Jane of the Concrete Jungle. So concrete jungle, I take it you're a city kid. Um, I, I was I was born, raised, yeah, poor as they come. Um, one of the largest ghettos in Canada. Um, we call it the concrete jungle for a reason. Wow. Yeah. There Survival was, of the fittest. Yes, absolutely, 100%. I, I couldn't have uh, hit the nail on the head any harder than that. It really was. Um, yeah, it was an interesting place to grow up. Uh I I uh, I always felt like a misfit growing there because I was um, up until the age of five or six. My, I think it was six years old. I I was raised on farms and in suburbs, you know, where there was actual grass and trees and forests, and you go tobogganing and 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 all the fun mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and then I got sort of you know uh, kerplunked in the middle of uh, the concrete jungle. How did that come to be? Um, well, my birth mother won me back in the courts. And uh, I think she went to a two-week uh, course or something back in, we're talking back in the 70s, right? Um, and uh, because she did the two-week program, she was able to uh, gain me back. Um, so um, after five years of her you know, not being really around and disappearing and not showing up for courts, she ended up going in for this program. And uh, that's how she got me back. I was part of a project. There was a pilot project where the, the, the child services was trying to put families back together. Um, originally, we started, there was 12 of us for this pilot project. They took um, the most saddest, you know, children, um, you know, the most um, troublesome ch children, we'll say, and uh, put us back in the care of our birth uh, guardian. And in my case, it was my mother. Um, now we're jumping forward many years later. I'm the last one out of that pilot project that still walks this earth on this plane. Wow. Yeah. So was it? Families who had been um, broken up through divorce or separation, or was this when no, you said kid, these, the saddest kids? Is that the kid that was the problem, or this that the family had dissolved? The the families had more than dissolved. An example, I'll use my birth mother. Um, my birth father damn near killed her. He beat her so bad she was in the hospital. And, um, you know, we're talking like a really serious case. She was in a coma the whole bit for a month and had to relearn to walk, talk the whole bit. Um, 
because of the meds that she had been on, she ended up becoming highly addictive to other substances, street drugs, the works, booze, pills, everything. And how old were you at this time? Um, that I don't know. I want to say about one or one and a half based on stories that I've been told. Um, like the SWAT team was even out on the roofs of the houses cause there, like he, there was blood everywhere. It was like a, a horror story. It was in the newspaper. Actually it hit the news. Um, that's how bad it was. He ended up going to, um, um, a, a large facility that's very well known for very dangerous men. And she had gone through this stuff and, um, just ended up not ever being really okay again. Wow. And I look just like him. So. Um, the constant uh, reminder, once she did get me back and the older I grew, the more I looked like him, the more she hated me. It was a very twisted fucking, so it's like, you know, the it, the worst uh, things that a parent could go through or the worst kind of parents and the children that came from this, you know, this domestic um, violent type um, drug addiction, you know, the works. Mm. Um and there was the 12. We were the worst 12 across Canada. Wow. So your father was incarcerated at the point when your mom got you back? Yes. So you didn't... I believe him. so. Did no. You ever, did you ever... I mean, I think, he, I think he was already out by then. I, I think he served two years um, in a pen, like prison, mm -hmm. um, for dangerous, very dangerous men. And um, uh, yeah... I, I like I, I've only heard stories about him along the way. I, I got a chance to meet him later on when I turned 18. I was allowed to meet him hmm. from the courts. Yeah. Um, that's how dangerous of a man he. How'd he, that go? Um, he was good to me. Um, if I ever pushed any borders with him, you know, I, I, I grew up with boys, boys kind of raised me and that grew into men and I grew into a woman, like, you mm -hmm. know, I, I hung around guys more than I did girls. I never got along with girls. I always thought like a guy and could do things like a guy sports, the works. Um, uh, sorry, what was your question? I I'm, asked I'm if kind how of, it was to meet, how it was to meet your, your birth father. Oh, um, okay. So he was a pretty blunt guy. Um, he came, we met at, in a restaurant with my, his sister who I found and, you know, the whole bit when I turned 18, I started seeking out who my father's side was cause I hated my mother's side. And, um, he sat down, uh, a quarter of hash in front of me and he said, Hey, Jane, I'm your father. You know, and uh, you want to smoke a joint. <laughs> and I wow. thought, wow, this is kind of cool. <laughs> I have a cool dad. <laughs> I, I have a cool dad, right? Um, and I've heard horror stories about him as I grew, you know, from my birth mother. So, um, but I, there's something that I still wanted to meet him. Yep. I, I wanted to meet him and, you know, knew, know where I came from and the whole bit. Mm -hmm. So we ended up going to his place. Um, my aunt said it was fine and don't worry. And, you know, kind of gave him the little nod, like, you know, uh, it's going to be okay kind of thing. Cause you could tell he was kind of nervous too. Right. Mm -hmm. Naturally. Naturally. And we wouldn't make eye contact. It was the funniest thing. We were both kind of awkward. Um, about three joints in man, we were like just eye to eye talking like you and I right now. And, and wow. he was very blunt, very, um, very big man. Very tall, very like solid 250. Um, yeah, tattoos, the works, like really, really solid dude. And um, yeah, that started my relationship with him. And he was he was good to me. Um, there was a point I was mentioning earlier, you know, he had his boundaries, though. Um, so I'm used to sparring with guys. You mm -hmm. know, we just spar and goof off and get the swords or, you know, the and and that's something that was not allowed. Um, I, I, I pretended to spar with him and he just grabbed my wrist and he looked me straight in the eye. He didn't say a fucking word. And then he let go. And I knew what my what his boundary was and not to do things like that. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he treated me like a, he called me doll. He treated me like a China doll. Like I was, I was breakable and he didn't want to, you know, so he showed me those borders, mm -hmm. man. He was great. I had a child and, uh, he was great with her. Um, and then he passed away at a very young age. He was 49. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, 
he, he tried to stay sober for me. He really tried. And, um, you know, I would even sit in the mo- uh, the AA meetings and this meeting and that meeting, and I'd go with him. And um, he taught me a lot about addiction, actually, at a very young age, mm. and, at 18, 19, 20. And um, he just, he ended up going back. And um, so I lost him the last year of his life. And, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't bring my kid around that. So. No. Um, it's unfortunate. And then, yeah, Christmas Eve was when I found out he had passed in 96. Yeah. It wow. was, it, it kind of for 20 years. Cause my last conversation with him was, was not a nice conversation. It was like, I was my father's daughter in that moment. Like you fucking did this and you fucking did that. And you're a fucking asshole and fuck you. And you know, you don't give a shit about me or my daughter. You're just like my mother. You know, I went right out off and Mm. we never spoke again and a year later he died wow so i carried that guilt for 20 years i'm better now about it yeah i don't feel so bad now but in that moment because i was i was rightfully angry at him as you had every right to yeah and and that was when i started really because he taught me about addiction and then he ended up going back and I think that was that made me angry more than anything. So meeting him was very interesting. I would say I got a good seven years out of him, and 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 he was uh, he was right on, man. He was blunt, very very fucking blunt, <laughs> and straight to the point. Um, when I did, you know, wrestle with the addiction with cocaine and crack, you know, it was the eighties now, and that was the new Your thing. Your addiction, my addiction. Yeah, I ended up becoming addicted to crack and cocaine. Wow. Yeah, for um. A short time, I would say six months, but it was enough. And uh, he actually, he's like, let's go. We're going right now. I heard you're on this shit. Brought, went to the place, got the drugs, went back to his place. Now I went from smoking hash with my dad to smoking crack with my dad. Right? That's wow. pretty fucking trippy shit. And he's like, I'm telling you, Jane, this this is bullshit. This is a waste of fucking money. And if you don't stop smoking this shit, like I'm sweating, my heart's pounding. I don't feel high. I'm sweating and my heart's pounding. What are you smoking this shit for? Mm-hmm. And uh, he threw a joint in front of me of, of, of weed. Now smoke that. And I smoked that and I was fucking high. He's like, that is getting high. This, you continue this, you're, you, you better learn how to suck a dirty dick. Wow. Straight up to my face. And then I was like, oh, my God, this is like, he's right, because I seen all of my friends from the park right, uh, doing some things that, you know, that's their stories. But, yeah. Wow. So I, I almost got sucked in. I was that close. Yeah. It's a slippery slope, isn't it? Very slippery. It, it happened so fast. And I, it, my first time trying it was like in a staircase and I didn't get anything from it. And the second time I tried it was at someone's birthday party. And I was hooked for like six months. And was, how old were you at that point? I want to say I was like 20. Um, because, yeah, I want to say I was like 20. And it was like fall when I started and just after my 21st birthday was when it was like I had enough that was it Mm -hmm. Um, and I lost everything I lost um, a great guy I was with he was a very good a very good guy Um, we were together for I think fuck since we were 15 anyway wow yeah and um, he thought I was having an affair but I was actually addicted to drugs and hiding it from him he knew I was hiding something but he thought it was me having an affair Wow. Yeah. Well, I guess it was kind of an affair. It was. And I was lying. Yeah. Wow. And hiding it. And it's almost like another person came into your relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Like really, really. Um, and, and, and looking back now as a grown, like more grown woman, you, I think you're, you know, in 20, you're still kind of a kid. You, yep, you're just absolutely. naive and you're, you know, partying absolutely. and checking shit out and stuff. But how easy it was to just... Huck yeah. Yeah. Just Especially how if you easy. grow up, if you're growing up around it and it's all around you. Addiction was everywhere. My it's mother not... was an addict. All my friends' mothers were addicts. Like you got a bunch of single women, you know, and they're, they all have kids and they're fucking, they, you know, they came from domestic violence. They lost their husband because they went off to war or whatever the case was. There was every woman in that fucking place was sad. Every mother was sad. And then you get the odd mothers who were like churchgoers, the whole bit, like, you know, and their kids and they were strict and, you know, but in a different way. 
there was no addiction. So when you when I saw stuff like that, it reminded me of where I was before I came into the park. Mm -hmm. it, and I'm like, oh, it's it, it is real. After being told for years that it's not real and that was a fake life. And, you know, even wow. even they don't want you, you know, kind of feeling and being told that like nobody wants you and that's why you're here. And it was wow. just, yeah, crazy stuff. I'm kind of babbling at this point. But no, yeah. that, I mean, it's a Meeting fascinating my father story was, when you hear those things coming out, um, you know, to to hear it not on the news, but to hear it from somebody who lived it, survived it. Yeah. It's normally something that if you don't, if you're not the kind of in the area where it happens or you're oblivious. living there yourself, you're hearing about it on the news. On the news. Oh, there's that area. Oh, there's another gut that shot. That area. Oh, you know, someone they, else they got murdered. Intersections and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just like. You, you, and everybody on the outside stayed away and we weren't allowed out of that area. Really? So it was like a division of worlds. And within our world, there was a division because during the 70s, there was the white power, black power war going on still between mm. different eth like backgrounds. Um, and that was from the, the higher generation above us. Like it, it just it was really a really, really messed up time. Um, and um, I, I was on the wrong side because all the, you know, all the Caucasians, for example, we're in, you know, one part of it and all the darker skinned people were, we were segregated and I was living on the side where all the darker skinned and I'm very pale skinned. Mm. Um, so I was, I was put in a, in a, in a very risky situation, even as a child, um, in the middle of these wars, like there would be men chasing one man from either or side, um, beating each other up with chains and hockey sticks. And like, I mean, it was. It was real spray paint, white power, black power, spray painted all over the walls, everywhere, the really? ground. It was, yeah, all over. It was, it was, um, there were, and then when the eighties hit and when crack hit, that's when people started. It's interesting that the, the addiction came from it, but that's when people started talking more and our generation grew into like, well, this is my friend. I've mm -hmm. grown up with this person, like my friend, Michael. You know, the first time I met him, mm -hmm. um, I think I, I mentioned this in passing when we had a conversation a while ago about um, the first time I met him, I had never seen a, 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 a dark skinned person. Never, ever. Mm. So I, I thought his mom didn't wash him. And that sounds horrible, but that mm. was the mindset of a six year old. Like I and, and he slapped me across the face. And then he went home, told his mom, and his mom was one of those church going moms. And he came back and found me in the park and uh, explained to me what was actually going on. And it was when I was like eight was when I started really growing up fast with the whole war and the beatings and this and picking sides and the whole whatever. And then when our generation hit, you know, I would say 15, 16 years old, we were friends with everybody. Hmm. You know, and there was people we didn't like or whatever, but, you know, like a normal, you know, but we had our crew of people and we were all different backgrounds hmm. and our parents didn't like that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's like being in a, in a forge, you know, it's mm -hmm. not, not just growing up. You know, with friends, it's like being put put into the fryer every day. Every single day. Walking to school, I'd get bullied. Coming home, I'd get bullied. I'd get home, depending on the mood that my mother's in, who knows where that's going that day. Mm -hmm. So there was really no safe place, not even walking to school. And so did you have any means of escape, like personal escape? Not out of the vicinity, but in your mind? Um, music was a big part for me. Um, I, I do love music and I always have, um, my first movie I saw at the theater was Grease, you know, and all the songs that went around, you know, along with that movie. Um, my girlfriend, when I was living in the suburbs would, would act out, you know, I would be, <laughs> you know, Olivia Newton-John and she'd be, you know, uh, John Travolta, it just funny things, really funny things. Um, so music got me through, um, 
uh, to be honest, by the time I was 10, I was already smoking cigarettes and started smoking pot around 12. Um, you know, drinking the bottoms of her beers. Wow. Yeah, like I was already, um, I was already, yeah, using at a very young age, younger than like, I didn't even have my fucking period yet. And I'm already like getting high and drunk. Wow. Yeah. It's really fucked up smoking cigarettes, all the big butts in the ashtrays. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I remember the first. So that shit got me through. Yeah. yeah. First time I tried a cigarette was my dad left one in the ashtray. I don't know how old I was, but it was still burning in the ashtray. And uh, I, I, I had seen people smoke, so I knew what to do. I yeah. knew what the, what the procedure was, right? Right. And I thought I was going to die. Yeah. I, I liked it. And uh, I liked the head rush I would get from them. Yeah. And it's funny because every once in a while I'll smell somebody smoking cigarettes and it'll take me back to that time hmm. or another time when, I don't know, I think we were probably in grade four or five when a neighborhood friend and I, he stole a couple of cigarettes from his mom or dad. <laughs> Somebody always does, eh? And we rode our bikes out far from home and then we ran off into the woods and, you know, hiding under the trees to smoke them. And I can still, every time I smell that, yeah. I, it's like it, right there. It, yeah. Smell is an interesting trigger. Mm -hmm. it, it, different smells can bring you back to places. Um, Old Spice, I can't stand it, you know. I made sure not to wear it today. I, I appreciate you so <laughs> well, much. I, I mean, we're, I we're, we're talking, you, uh, you know, yeah. it's, not, it's like not even noon. So yeah. there's no need for cologne before noon. No, <laughs> well, it, it just, you know, th that to me brings me back to like yeah. crazy places in, in my memories and in my past. You know, for me, it's like I my my dad was never a particularly kind person. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to hear and that. And I man. associate the smell of rum mm. with him. Yeah. Yeah. Rum and cigarettes, right? Yeah. And I mean, for some people, you know, if you're, you know, say if you're a hardcore sailor, that might mean something different yeah. to you. Yeah. But no, yeah, I feel it's, that. It's at the, it's when those smells trigger something like that. Yeah. And it's just like every time it's like, sometimes it's inescapable. I mean, if a cigarette smoke is blowing by, you're going to smell it. You're going to smell it. Yeah. Or, you yeah. know, rum is less likely because I don't buy it because I don't really you don't like it. Like it. You yeah. know, sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, whenever I smell it or taste it, I yeah. think of him and it's just like, yeah. why do I want to put myself through that? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. For me, it's that Zambuca shit, man. I can't, I will, you'll never find a bottle of that shit in my house. And I like to have a drink from time to time. Yeah. I won't touch that shit. I don't like the smell of it. The black licorice. Yeah. That reminds me of her, of my birth mother. Really? Yeah. She liked that shit. Like it was like going out of style. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she loved that wow. booze, all of it, but that was her shot drinks, you know? Yeah. Yeah, fucking Zambuca. Yeah. Gross. Yeah, music became a real escape for me, too. And music. It's obviously become my, most of my life at this point. But, You're very yeah. talented, I must say. Well, thank you. I didn't. I, 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 I quite enjoy, um, uh, you know, you get... You get sick of listening, uh, you know, great band. I don't like them personally because you, you know, ACDC, for example, you know, God bless them. But like you hear them 12 times, you know, a day on the radio. I'm sick of the radio at this point, mm -hmm. to be honest. All great artists, you know, everybody great artists. But when you hear someone doing a different rendition of a song, you know, I yep. quite enjoy that. Yep. Um, not only can you hum along to it sometimes, but you know, some of the words and, mm -hmm. and it's just a different feel. So it, it doesn't, you know, like bring you back mm -hmm. if music, a certain, for me, it's ACDC that brings me to a bad place mm -hmm. in my past. So, but if you were to do, you know, hell's bells and you were like, hell's bells, I would be like, okay, I can take this, Sultry lounge singer. you know, yeah. but it's the, you know, Yeah. Music is definitely uh, a great escape for me. Still. So are you creative with music as well? Do you play? Um, it's funny. I started learning uh, piano in high school and I really took off. I would do it before school started, um, during lunch hours, instead of going out for smokes, I was playing the piano after school. Um, eventually the receptionist, you know, she said, could you learn another song other than O Canada? <laughs> 
<laughs> so I went fine, and I went right to Beethoven, um, and started learning. You know, the the for Elise, right? right. And um, I I was just getting it, and then well, then uh, you know that's when acid started coming into play, and you know. You don't really go to much school when you're doing acid. So I dropped the piano, obviously, for a while. And then I picked up the guitar here and there, the drums here and there. Yeah, I can do the basic one, two, three, four, you know, yeah. um, on the drums. Uh, a little bit of guitar, you know, through throughout my 30s. A little bit when I was in high school, but not... I, I learned more in my 30s. But then being sick... Um, you forget a lot of things. It's like, um, you know, this muscle memory, neuropaths and this right. kind of thing. There's only certain things that actually still do that where I can remember how to, I don't know, I'm going to use a really bad example, unscrew the top of a bottle, you know, rather than getting the like actually twisting it, right. um, you know, basic little things. Um so yeah, I'm I'm currently right now trying to relearn the piano. Cool. My daughter is an amazing, my youngest daughter is an amazing piano player. And she's just trying to remind me of, you know, where center C is and, you know, this and that. So yep. I, I've been practicing a little bit. I'm hoping to wow you one day, actually. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. I would love that. Yeah, creativity and any kind of expressions. Like, mm -hmm. I... Um, I, I teach music as well, so I often have students that get very down on themselves, especially adult beginners. It's a really tough thing for an adult to do mm -hmm. because they've been all their life working at getting good at things, and then all of a sudden here they're faced with something that they really are not good at. And I feel that 100%. Yeah, so I, I am constantly reminding people that it's like, you know, you're just catching up, that's all. Yeah. You know, you're catching yeah. up to where your ambition left off. Yeah. You know, and it's like everybody that plays an instrument or plays music or dances or draws I or something as a too. child yeah. and gives it up in order to do adulting. Adulting. Always, always regrets it. Yeah. And it's not like it demands hours a day out of you i you know for somebody that that has trouble practicing their guitar yeah i say just leave it in your bedroom yeah leave it out in your bedroom put it on a stand put it on a wall hanger yeah. play it for a couple of minutes before you go to bed and just don't let it lose its place in your life yeah and then that this this student last night she's i'd say she's in her mid-30s absolute beginner at piano Nice. Uh, probably her third month of lessons. Right on. And um, she's super ambitious. She's she's jumping way into the deep end of the pool, bringing That's, in these pieces of music where the, the page is just littered with notes that I have difficulty reading. And I've yes. been doing this for a bunch of years. And she says, well, I'm having trouble with this. And I'm like, well... Yeah. Yeah. And we, which this is a song that I really like to learn how to play. And it's like, well, why don't you learn a couple of chords first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then so but see I, that that's very that's me, though. Yeah. Always trying to push yourself to be. Yeah. Yeah. Quick. Yep. But um, there is usually a, a procedure to these kind of things. And everybody's procedure it's, is different. It's the patience of actually doing the redundancy and doing the like learning. You're getting it to the point where it's a redundancy. It is. It's not like yeah. you have to practice um, how to walk anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, or I, or I use the analogy of video games with kids. I said, do you mm. watch your fingers on the controllers when you're playing the game? No. And They've like, already memorized where their fingers go. And I said, how do you think your fingers got that way? Yeah. By you doing it. Yeah. By you practicing, practicing. your video game. Yeah. And they're like, well, it's not practice. I'm playing it. Like, well, yeah, you probably weren't very good at it the first time. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny, the younger the kid, the more proud they are. Oh, yeah, I was awesome at it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, but, yeah, you make a very strong uh, few points, actually. Um, yeah, it's um, because I did excel in so many things myself, um, from sports to, um, well, school, not so much, but like sports, anything that boys did, I wanted to do. Um, if that was fishing, I was the best fisher 
person. You know, if it was hockey, um, you know, I had to make sure I got at least one slap shot in, you know, this kind of thing. Baseball, the whole bit. My my eye-hand coordination still to this day is amazing. It's impeccable um, because of all those years of practicing mm -hmm. all those different things, like throwing a ball. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the redundancy, right? And you eventually do get good enough where you can throw where you're supposed to throw the ball and catch the ball and not, you know, watch it get bigger and smash you in the face. Um, mm -hmm. Those were lessons I learned. <laughs> yeah. But I had to do it and I had to be good at it. So I felt I feel that kind of vibe with relearning the, mm -hmm. the piano again. I feel that like, why can't I pay, play for O Canada even, you know, and then I remembered a little bit of twinkle, twinkle, little star. And I was quite proud of myself, you know, because there was that little blurp of memory. And I was like, oh, this is easy. Oh, I remember this. It's the tones and actually being mindful and listening. I have my headphones on, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm not really bugging anybody because, you know, I live with like all these students right now. It's funny. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm finding the tones again and i'm feeling the the keys and mm -hmm. um it, it's a really good way to um to escape without using mind-altering drugs or alcohol absolutely it's the right brain effect yeah and you can I, I it's again if you go back to things that i try to say to you know music students to encourage them to keep playing i said mm -hmm. when you can get to the point where you can do anything mm -hmm. without having to be thinking about it mm -hmm. too hard. Mm -hmm. I said, the best thing you can do for yourself is close your eyes mm -hmm. and just keep repeating it and repeating it. And don't worry about, you know, how fast you're playing it yeah. or anything like that. No, But it's that moment where you let your right brain just go with do. it. You're not analyzing anything. Yeah. You're just enjoying the sound of what you're doing. What you're doing. Even if it's just like four notes on a guitar yeah. Or two ukulele chords, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. Or a chord on the piano. Anything. Nice big major seven chord. Sounds like Christmas, you know. <laughs> um, well, you're all fancy and stuff. I'm not there yet. You let me catch up now. Well, it's, it's all music theory is basic. You know, you got to know how to count to 12 yeah. and you have to know your alphabet to G. Yeah. Once you know that, you just you're, apply you're those good. rules over yeah. and over again. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm learning right now. Yeah. The, the, yeah. So we got a bunch of your your backstory here, and I think we're going to go for quite a few episodes here, getting things out. I mean, sure, you know it's 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 kind of like you know when you live with these things your whole life, you, you know that you've internalized them, mm -hmm. but when you speak them, mm -hmm. um, it becomes a different kind of reality, especially when you're talking to someone who's not like me, who's not someone you grew up with, mm -hmm. and if you're having people listen to this. Um, who may or may not have had the same experiences as you. As we bring this first um, episode to a close, what do you think you want to tell people about what to expect in, in further um, episodes? Like, what what's your message? What's your motivation behind us doing this recording right now in the next few? What do you want people to know about you? So firstly, I'd like to say um, the people who lived outside of and had, you know, three meals a day and and lived a decent life. I mean, everybody's got their house and their families and I get that. But the people that, you know, are afraid of or felt like, you know, anybody that came from the ghetto or poor people are scary. I can tell you there are people that are scary in any household, wherever you come from. Um, there's also good people. I'm a good person. I didn't maliciously go out and hurt people. I didn't, you know, I didn't maliciously try to hurt people in any way. So, you know, there's, there's still a, a, you know, a lot of great, beautiful roses in, in a concrete jungle, you know, mm -hmm. like there's still beauty within the beast. Um, secondly, um, you know, we talked again earlier about, you know, the word perseverance. I've been told that I persevered and I've, I'm, per, I'm a perseverer and I, you know, I've, I, I, it's more about going through and not sitting and stewing. Um, you know, you just got to keep fucking going one foot in front of the other. Cause if you don't, you're, you're just going to be stuck. 
and I'm too much of a butterfly. I'm wild and crazy. So I want to live. I want to keep going. So I just keep putting one foot in front of the other and I keep going. If that's perseverance, fine. Um, but with that comes with some backlashes. There's things that I haven't talked about. There's things that I've been holding in for fucking years, like decades. And um sharing my story, I hope shows, um, through some of the triumphs that I have gone through, um, you can, you can still have a decent life. You don't have to stay stuck. Um, and I've watched a lot of my, um, old crew stay stuck and, um, I got out and anybody can get out of any bad situation if they really needed to, they just got to put one foot in front of the other. So that's kind of, you know, uh, what I, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some of the dark shit I've been through, mm -hmm. um, you know, to some of the greatest things I never thought I'd ever do. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, episode one, Visions webcast, we have Jane of the Concrete Jungle. And uh, we're going to be back with more episodes on more interesting things from the life of Jane. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hope you uh, tune in for more. Thanks for having me. <laughs>